My name is Beth. I am the adult program librarian here at the library. And this event is part of a three-part series about the 1883 Octagonal Barn. If you haven't yet, go upstairs to the second floor to the big back blue wall, and he's got a whole display there of memorabilia and lots of photographs of the restoration and um, saving of the barn. And there are some really neat things that they found <laughs> when they were restoring the barn. I don't know how many of you ended up in the display, but when he came in with them, my eyes got great big because the best one, did you put the paintbrush in the display? There is a huge paintbrush, like the bristles are like this, and it's hard as a rock. I don't know what they used it for, but it was so cool. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Richard Tyler, the current owner of the Seacrest Barn. And I'm not going to try and introduce him because he'll do a better job than that from me. So take it away, Rich. OK, thank you. So uh, glad you're here. And um, before we start, I, wa I want to confess that I'm actually not a farmer. <laughs> and actually, it's worse than that. I'm not from Iowa. <laughs> and it's actually worse than that. I'm from Canada originally. <laughs> so excuse all those things. Uh, we're going to go over the saving of the Seacrest 1883 octagonal barn. And I want to start off just sort of where it's at. It's actually in Johnson County. And I'll show this at the end as well. But um, basically, we're here in Iowa City. And Highway 6 heads out towards West Liberty and Interstate 80 to Bus Branch out here. And the, the barn is on a gravel road in the middle of nowhere about a mile, half a mile west of Downey in Johnson County. And we'll come back to that again later. So just to put things in context, uh, the new capital in 1865 here in Iowa City. Um, and what's important about the building of the barn in Iowa at that time was the Mississippi River. And that was important for several reasons. But one was for floating down wood to build structures, including the barn. Uh, the wood came from uh, Minneapolis and Illinois up north and floated down. And what's important also is, so here's Iowa City. If you were going to go and get wood, you would have to go through. And here's Downey on the map, and West Liberty, and then probably Muscatine is the closest place for the, for the wood. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. So these are the these are the gravel roads that were used by stagecoaches and horses to move things around in transportation at that time. So here's an example of the logs floating down the Mississippi River. And I've given some talks at some of the uh, log factories on the river. So uh, this is the town of Downey. And this was produced in 1872. And there's not much, not much bigger than that now, actually. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why Downey was successful and perhaps why the Seacrest Barn was established there was because it had train tracks. And so you could bring in supplies and cattle and ship out crops. And so having the train tracks in a place where the trains could stop were really important. Um, they had somebody who had this, this plan here had all kinds of plots. It turns out that there weren't that many more houses built after this 1872 figure. And when I first started this project, I decided I would have a town picnic for the, for the town of Downey. And so I asked a few people, I knocked on some doors, and it's unincorporated. And they all said, this woman who lived in the corner is in charge. <laughs> So I, I knocked on the door, and I said, hi, I'm Rich Tyler. I'm restoring the barn, the round barn out of town. She said, yes, I know. <laughs> and I said, I'd like to have a picnic. That was fine. So I came back a couple weeks later, and she said, that's just OK. So I actually did some adverts in the West Branch paper and the Iowa City paper. And we actually had probably about 60 or 80 people, many of them from around the state, and even some from out of state who used to live there. So the town of Downey and the train tracks. Um, this is also interesting in my research in this. Um, it had a bank, and the bank is still there, actually. Here's the train tracks over here. 
And one interesting thing that I discovered is when the, the bank was built and they shipped in a, a safe so that people couldn't steal from the bank, how do you think they got the safe from the train into the bank? They built a wooden bridge from the train tracks in through the front window of the bank, which was pretty cool, I thought, too. OK, so this is the train station. And these are the people, the, the guys living in Downey at the time. And I don't know this for sure, but I think this guy in the end looks like the biggest and the strongest. I'm going to suggest that he's probably Joshua, he's probably Frank Longerbeam, the carpenter that actually built this barn. And this is the Longerbeam house. At those times, there were no social media. If you wanted to advertise your skills as a barn builder, you built a fine house, and people could see how skilled you were. And this was the house that the family sent me this picture later on. Um, so when I first got there, this is what we walked through and took some pictures and explored some things. And uh, a couple years later, the house was gone. And of course, people won't even know that the house was even there now, which is kind of sad. OK, so um, Frank Longerbeam, living in Downey, is going to get his wood uh, in, on the river, on the Mississippi River. And he goes to um, Muscatine. And there's a well-to-do uh, lumber yard and lumber baron and stock farm guy named Benjamin Hershey. And Benjamin Hershey contacted a, an architect, I think, from New York. Uh, to build this rectangular barn in 1878. And what's special about this barn is it has a bell-shaped roof. So that's very rare for any buildings at that time. So this was designed, and uh, Frank Longerbeam, horse and wagon, going on that map from uh, Downey to um, Muscatine, sees this barn. And he and, and he, this is the inside picture of that barn. So there's all this laminated wood uh, attached with square nails. Uh, this is what the barn looked like in 1846, abandoned, and the barn is no longer there. So I'm guessing that the idea for this roof uh, came from uh, the carpenter, Frank Longer, being picking up his wood and seeing this barn when it was constructed. So I found this in the West Branch paper in 1883. One and a half miles west of Downey is now the finishing one of the foundation, with the largest building of its kind in the country, octagon, 75 feet in height, stable room for 32 horses and 16 cows. I haven't found any of the modern conveniences yet. <laughs> but beyond that, I think this is pretty remarkable. So this is Joshua Seacrest. And at the land in Iowa have an acre. Um, he and his wife uh, bought this. They apparently planned the barn around the kitchen table at the farmhouse, which was actually from the 1850s and still there. So um, what we think they did was that they, whoops, was that they, um, uh, they dug a little trench, um, filled it up with water, and uh, soaked the wood in these one, one by sixes, and then uh, had stamped, uh, banged in these little stakes in the ground, uh, wrapped them around, hammered them in with square nails, and then took the second one and the third one and the fourth one, and built this rib one at a time um, with nails and a bolt going all the way through finally. Then they built the foundation, uh, including this is uh, stone at the bottom and uh, a wooden floor. And then this is sort of like a McDonald's arch or something yeah. like that. And they've got horses and, and people on stilts pulling this up slowly. <coughs> Excuse me. And they get it up in place. And does anybody want to volunteer for this job up here? <laughs> and so they're going to pull up the other ones one at a time, like a birdcage, is when it finishes up. So that's the, the underlying foundation of the barn. Um, not exactly to scale, but and so this is the lamination in there now um, that is still in pretty good shape, actually. 
uh, bolts all the way through, and square nails attaching all the way through as well. So 1992, when I first saw the property, I was looking for some place out in the country for my two young children to see if we'd go camping in some woods or something like that nearby West Branch where I was living. And uh, a friend pointed out this property down the road and she said, uh, maybe the, the, nobody's living in the farmhouse, the barn's empty, maybe he'd sell it to you. So I um, went down, saw the place, it was all falling down and apart, and they talked to the owner, and um, he offered it to me basically for the price of the land, and I said, well, I'll think about it. I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen here. So um, eventually, uh, he called me about a month later and said he'd found somebody who was interested in buying it. But uh, all of a sudden, it was mine. So it was in pretty bad shape. It was uh, tilting, uh, holes. This is a wood shingle roof. Um, and it was a mess. Uh, so this is what it looked like. There were two corn cribs. These were built later on. Um, and uh, this uh, cattle feeding shed and silo were built later. But um, it was all... Um, anyways, uh, the cupola on the top was spectacular, and I'll show you later the stairs to go up there. It's pretty scary, but I have been up there. Um, and this is the view from the cupola, and I found this um, looking towards uh, the town over here, where the people are coming for the picnic later on. And this is the gravel road going up to the barn, which is here. So that's the view. Um, again, this is what it looked like originally when I first saw it and took, had two pictures taken. So in, in a mess, um, this is standing in the middle, and there's no barn like this anywhere. It's pretty spectacular. How many people have actually been inside the barn? So several of you. Um, so uh, standing in the middle of the barn, looking straight up, uh, you can see this suspended staircase, but these are all holes the water can come through whenever it rains, so that's pretty scary. Um, these are the suspended staircase, um, which I have locked up now, but um, I usually would go up there in the spring to open up the windows and in the fall to close the windows, and there's some work, but again, you can see the holes in the, in the, in the roof. Um, so um, the place was covered, when I bought it, was covered in loose hay and garbage everywhere, which was potentially very dangerous because it might catch fire. Uh, there was lots of junk and stuff to clear up. This is looking at the, out the front door, um, seeing where all the loose hay is and things, and a bit of a mess here and there. Uh, this is my sister, Sheila, who came to visit, wondering what the heck is this guy doing anyways? So uh, anyways, that's a, a good picture of, again, what the floor looked like. And again, the internal structure, which is just remarkable, and in this point, uh, full of holes in the roof. This is the attached cattle feeding shed. So it actually has a train car in it. And again, it was added on later, but it's actually, these are actually train wheels from a train car. And, it wouldn't, and then it would, they would drop the hay down from the top floor, stop it on the second floor, put it on this train car inside the barn, and then put it out into this cattle feeding shed, drop it off into some feeding stalls, and they could bring the cattle in from outside to feed them instead of taking it out to take care of them. So again, uh, you can see the holes in the roof and the ladders going up. Um, this is the basement. So this is where there were horse stalls. They had been removed. Um, there was for the horses. Um, so I had to search around and see what they might have looked like. So uh, this is a picture of me in the Quad City Times that it was shot. Um, Joshua Seacrest. Um, so I was fortunate to connect with uh, Van Winkle Jacob Engineering Company. And um, they were just so amazing and so clever and so sophisticated 
and what they actually did. There were two major problems with the barn. Uh, one problem was it was a bank barn. So this was a dirt going all up, up against this wall. And several barns were built like that. So it had a, a bank on this side, but not on the back. So the horses and animals could move in and out here. But the problem with that is that this is all full of dirt pushing in on that wall. And so one of the major issues was this wall was pushing in and pushing the barn over in that direction, tilting it that way. The other problem uh, was uh, the compressive load of the roof was pushing down. So the, um, the uh, wood shingles were, of course, wet and, and had been up there for a long time. And one of the consequences of that is these ribs, these laminations that we saw, were all being pushed out. So I'll, um, to, to fix the, the pushing here, they, they took this out. Um, and uh, I'll show you more in a minute. Um, the other thing, to pull in, again, it's out all the corners. Um, what they did was they, they put a clamp around each of those ribs, and then just underneath that second floor, they put a steel rods clamped to the one. And I remember I had them all lined up, and uh, I was sort of wondering how far in they would pull those, and actually some of them went 8 to 10, 12 inches to pull those in gradually over uh, several hours. So uh, this is a, some diagrams I made to help get things started. All the lamination, the roof, how it comes out like this, and this bell-shaped roof with the exterior wall and the foundation down below. Um, this is the um, lamination like we saw in the barn um, on the river in Muscatine, and there's these layers of lamination square nails going through here, and bolts going through the whole thing. So here is where they attach to the, to the, to the second floor there, where they come down and attach, uh, with the bolts all the way through. Um, this is a uh, bolt in the basement, a beam in the basement um, that had cracked. And uh, one of my neighbors at the time came in and took care of this, and we pumped this up and clamped it uh, safe and sound. And um, one of the interesting things is because it's shaped like this, it can't bend and twist out of place. So this is the bladed scarf joint, as it's reported, and this is in the barn. Um, but it turns out that this post is in the wrong place. Anybody know where it should be? Right, it should be right underneath this one because the, the load of the, down below here can crack this and then this piece can come down. So um, Walger Beam corrected this later by a couple of places. He actually chopped this off and put a piece of wood out underneath like that. But, so here is where the um, rods are connected to the inside of the, of the two corners of the barn. Uh, with a rod that goes through the inside and is, as I mentioned, anchored with a cement block outside. So here's the laminations, uh, the corner of the rib going up, the bell-shaped roof, and this is an angle in this corner that the structural engineers built. So going through the walls, carefully done to uh, control that. Uh, this is the, there's, so there's two of these, one on each side coming out, and they're actually buried out here. They put in a big concrete block under the ground and hooked it to that and then pulled up the barn one day very slowly. Um, so that was pretty scary. This is after the barn's been built. Uh, the outside uh, showing how those things are connected and were pulled in, and you can see the rib, how it, rounds out there as well. Some work had to be done down here on the foundation stones. Um, this is, this is uh, underneath that top floor, and you can see the rods coming 
back and forth, back and forth. I'll talk more about the horse in a minute. So um, it needed a new roof, and the original roof was um, wooden shingles. Um, and I don't know if I had a picture of the wooden shingles here. The, the wooden shingles, the wooden shingles had, a few, a few of them had Adnac stamped on the back of them. In fact, I think there's one upstairs. Adnac. And as soon as I saw that wooden shingle, I knew where it was from. Anybody? Canada. Canada. It's Canada spelled backwards. <laughs> it's amazing. And they were from British Columbia. So uh, in any event, um, with the restoration, you're supposed to try and put it back to its, what it was like. Uh, I couldn't afford to put wooden shingles on there, uh, though that can happen in the future. But uh, it was, uh, we had a new roof put on. Um, so the barn had to be painted. And um, so I'd never been up scaffolding before. So I, I didn't do all the painting. My son and I and my daughter helped a little bit. And I had hundreds of volunteers. But I'd never been on scaffolding before, which was pretty scary. Actually, the people that put on the roof were very helpful because they left the scaffolding on one side while we got that one side painted. So there was just all kinds of cooperation from volunteers and the uh, contractors and things was very good. So this is the barn with a new roof. Um, with, uh, it started to be painted red and the a new uh, the, some red up there in the cupola as well. Uh, this is the view from the cupola. Um, it's, uh, I, we had some damage with the uh, last couple months with wind and uh, hail, um, so some of these have to be replaced. But it's a pretty spectacular view, but uh, pretty scary going up there, to say the least. Um, so I uh, had to make a few minor changes for safety reasons. So I put in some wooden stairs uh, to go up and down. So there's two sets of stairs that go through. And uh, again, some volunteers going up there, try to keep it as original as possible, but had to make it safe as well. This is the bridge going in um, uh, to take away the, the dirt. Um, this is... Uh, in the, the basement, um, putting up some of the, the wood to hold things in place. This is the new brick wall that went up. Uh, and we went on to the cupola. So when I uh, had it painted, according to the historical societies, um, you have to try and make it as original as possible. So I, it was originally painted red, and the underside of the paint was red. In fact, inside the, this uh, shed there, you can see the original paint red. But the people in Downey didn't like that because they were used to it being painted white for 50 years. Um, but it was actually red originally. So uh, this is the, um, this is the uh, attached cattle feeding shed. Uh, these posts, when this was built, including in the basement of the barn, the floors were, wood, were, were dirt. And these wooden posts were actually going inside the dirt. And so not surprisingly, over the years, they rotted out. And that was part of why the whole building was sinking and sinking in different directions. And so that meant that had to be taken up. So we hoisted these up um, and then uh, took out the dirt, put some concrete in here, and dropped them down on some blocks. So and this is the tracks that that train car goes on here to drop it into these cattle feeding sheds there. So here's an example of the, this used to go down into the, into the ground. We filled up these holes with cement and then uh, made some stands for them to step on. Uh, I did not volunteer to do this either. So the round tile silo, apparently these silos were invented in Iowa. This was added later. Um, but they, uh, in one of the grants I had, they repointed that, um, and pretty scary looking. Um, not something I could do. Uh, so these are some of the volunteers in the shed. Um, uh, 
picking up scrap wood from other places and other barns and bringing them back to we try and keep it as original as possible. My daughter, Angela, um, getting stuck with some repair reparations. My son, Jeffrey, helping out. Um, and um, <laughs> anybody know who that is? Who? So um, I did some, uh, I contacted several people. Part of getting grants is that they want to know the place is available, uh, but they also want to know that people are using it, and it's the State Historical Society produces this funding. So in the early days, I contacted uh, Branstead's office, and, and actually, I think after that, um, went, have been awarded a Historical Society. Uh, emblem and document in the state capitol. But I, I invited him, and he came with a group, and I told, got the newspapers involved. And when you come in the door, there was two books to sign, one signed for visitors and one signed for volunteers. So I asked uh, Mr. Branstead which book he'd like to sign. So he said, well, the volunteer book, of course. So uh, I took him out back and had him shovel some cow manure. <laughs> so he made the front page of the West Branch newspaper, however. So that was good. So what's happened since then? Um, so the barn's in pretty good shape, actually. Uh, it does need a new paint job, and I've applied for a new paint grant uh, this year, which was denied but I'll be applying again next year. Um, but it, uh, the final job here, when it was all done uh, after this work and hundreds of volunteers and lots of uh, people, uh, produced something that was amazing. There's no barn like this in the world. Um, it's open every day. You're welcome to go out there. And uh, it's pretty special. And uh, it's in pretty good shape. It needs a new paint job, but it's in pretty good shape, generally speaking. So there's the rods going out, buried under the ground. So there's a big concrete slab underneath here that, that was pulled over. The dirt under here that was pushing it this way is gone. And um, so you've got the upper le level that was designed for 200 tons of loose hay, uh, the level for bringing in the hay and unloading it and storage. And then the uh, Horses and cattle are down below here in the basement and the door in the back to let them out. So pretty amazing. Uh, this is uh, a view from the back looking uh, to the west. And you can see the back of the barn. There's a door back here and doors to the shed um, in pretty good shape. Um, and I just want to finish by talking about some of the uh, things that we've actually found uh, in the property over the years. And so, again, uh, I'm a city boy, so I really had no idea what any of this stuff was. But um, I tried to save anything that I could find uh, on, the, on the property and try and save it and restore it and keep it as much as I possibly could. So, um, and it, some of you have some farming background, can correct me or provide some additional insights. So uh, this, I believe, was for throwing out seeds. So this would be pulled by a tractor, probably. And the, this would be filled up with seeds. And then this flies around and flips the seeds out. Does that make sense? Um, so this was a huge contraption um, and in terrible shape. And I've had. Uh, Lots of people come out and help scrape it and repaint it. And it's in excellent condition now, although it probably can't be used now. But it's, um, this was, is some kind of a harvester. So uh, this actually still goes around and around and around, or can be. It's not quite that easy. But um, this, would, this would move around and uh, pick up, I don't know, corn or stalks of hay, and then flip it back into the back. And there's also, you can see, um, uh, rubber um, chains and coordinated and all kinds of things to dump it out in the back. But this was actually, on, again, these were all on the property when I found it. And uh, again, I'm not sure exactly how it was used, but we replaced 
some of the wood, which was all rotten, and um, got it all painted. Um, and uh, although can't, not functional, it can see what it is. This was also back there. This is some kind of a rake, um, again, in pretty good condition. Um, and again, I tried to keep it as original as possible. So it's sitting out there in the back. Again, pulled along from the, from the front here. And then you've got all these little curved things pulling up stuff off the ground. So this was the real challenge. Anybody guess what this is for? Lifting wagons to unload them. You're exactly right, as far as I know. You can't. It's, you know, these days, of course, you can find almost anything on the internet. It's hard, hard to even find anything about something like this. They must have been extremely rare. But um, you know, you consider you got a big wagon full of corn or hay or something heavy, and it needs to be unloaded somehow for feed or whatever it is. And um, so you'd pull the wagon in here, and then there's two these little triangles on each side um, go underneath the back wheels or under the back uh, side and then this can be twisted and presumably pulled by something and these things go up and lifts up the wagon and things roll out I guess so it's uh, it's hard to even find any explanation for these things so uh, that's basically the end of the talk um, I uh, now on the, uh, contacted by the Iowa Barn Foundation, there's going to be a barn tour across Iowa uh, in September, and this time will be out, and I'm on the front page of their magazine, which I brought this uh, with me today. Um, I put in toilets. I tried to keep it as original as possible, but you have to make it functional. I put in toilets. Uh, we have parties. So this is in the old days, maybe, but this is a pumpkin party, and that's my daughter. Um, so um, I contacted, I really didn't know who this person was, but I, there, in uh, some of the towns in West Branch, P. Buckley Moss has done some beautiful pieces of work. And so I contacted her. I think she was living in Florida at the time. And uh, sure enough, she came up and... Uh, draw and took pictures and started painting the barn. I took her over to see the uh, Hoover birthplace cottage, which she'd never been to before. And she had actually painted that as well, and put it in the same picture. Um, but uh, that was pretty cool. And um, she came back a second time, I think the following year, and had a big P. Buckley Moss party in the barn <laughs> with lots of people upstairs. Um, one of the things that I haven't done yet uh, is to replace the windmill. There was a windmill there originally, and uh, the actual well I is there. I found the well. Apparently, when you buy, when you sell land like this out in the country, with an old well, you've got to fill it in or take care of it properly. Um, and I'm not sure this was done when I bought it off this guy, but it was filled in with clay. But the actual well is about this wide, and there's two blocks of bricks, like houses, that are not cemented together. And they go down, the, the owner told me, about 45 feet. So, so you can imagine <laughs> making that. What would it be like to dig this down, and then getting lower and lower, and putting, you know, getting the dick, and kind of 45 feet below? It's just scary even thinking about how something like that was built. So that's still there. I filled it in with, with dirt properly, but I've also got the top two, three feet open so you can see the loose bricks uh, around in that circle openings aside. So um, P. Buckley Moss was out a couple times and uh, did some good work. So uh, I took a class at the um, Hoover Presidential Library on restoration and things. And one of the things that they said was that uh, you're not supposed to pretend you have something old if you don't. And, and I, was, I was planning on making a horse. 
And uh, so I changed my mind because I, I had stuff to hang on the horse. And so uh, what I did was I just had a, I made a big drawing of a two by four sort of st statue of a horse. And I had this big drawing up. And I gave a tour to these uh, uh, elementary school students. And I showed them, I showed the horse equipment, and I showed this picture that I had of this two by four frame of a horse. And this 10-year-old uh, girl looked at me and she said, have you ever seen a horse before? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd better make something that looks like a horse. So I waited till the boss was out of town. I projected this horse on the conference room wall and traced it out. And so I made a real horse, sort of. Um, and then because I got skilled at this, <laughs> we actually did the same thing down in the basement where the cows were. And I've had some events you know, before COVID where there was lots of people and people bringing up hay and uh, brought out some real horses and things. And uh, I had people could actually learn how to milk a cow. <laughs> Has anybody here milked a cow before? Nobody wants to admit it, eh? OK. OK, well, actually, I got certified as a cow milker from the Minnesota State Fair. So I have milked a real cow. So this is, uh, you can go and count. So uh, lots of events out there. And I know some of you have been to some of the events. Um, I have tried my best to keep it as original as possible, but I've also had to make it safe. And um, so there's lots of uh, chairs. There's lots of music events. A lot of this was before, of course, the uh, COVID stuff. But uh, lots of events. Um, some beautiful uh, hanging uh, lights, um, uh, lots of musical events have been there, different performances, uh, dances. I'm having my 30th annual tinnitus conference um, for Ringing in the Ears coming up in August. And uh, I do a lot of research in that area. And the, I always have a square dance in the round barn every year. And the sad thing about that is when I go and give a talk in Europe or in China about my research, they don't ask me about my research. They ask me, how's the round barn, <laughs> which is terrible. So um, lots of events, uh, weddings. Oops, sorry. and. Uh, this is uh, uh, Martha Stewart in her magazine. <laughs> I didn't know that. I just saw these guys got married out there, and it was the barn was in the wedding. So that was in the, in the magazine. That was pretty cool. Um, I recall um, stopping off at a store and looking around Christmas time, and there was a Christmas card on the barn. <laughs> That shocked me. So of course, I bought them all out <laughs> uh, of Christmas cards. Uh, amazing that what you discovered. So here's P. Buckley Moss's picture again, uh, nicely done. So one of the other things that I found out there, and again, restored with, with help, is um, this is in one of the corn cribs. And so in the corn cribs, I guess they'd bring in corn um, and stock it in these sides, on the two sides. And I guess when they sell it, so they'd, a wagon would come in and they'd weigh the wagon before and then fill it up with corn and then weigh the wagon when it was full of corn and that they could tell how much corn was in there. So much to my surprise, there's a scale that is still functional. I mean, I don't know how accurate it is, but still functional. Um, and we've repainted the sign with some volunteers. But um, this is actually a scale. Some of the raccoons stay underneath. I sometimes say that uh, I think raccoons are smarter than a lot of people. And they do whatever they want. And um, if, if I thought about putting a padlock on one of the doors to keep the raccoons out, but I'm pretty sure the raccoon would go like this. <laughs> Figure out, how, figure out how to get in. In any event, this is the how standard scale in one of the corn cribs. So that's pretty cool. 
And this is behind it, so you can see how it would function uh, with these weights that move back and forth. And uh, pretty amazing uh, what was in this place and how it actually worked for years. Uh, so we saw these already. They got in here twice somehow. So that's the, sp the spreader, the uh, picking up stuff from the fields, uh, the wagon dumper. And uh, I found this um, actually today to verify that I was right. Um, so this is what this thing actually looked like. Um, you'd pull the wagon in here, put these under the wheels, crank it up, and it would pull up the wagon. So that's pretty clever. But it's hard to find anything about that. So there it is again, in good shape. So um, we'll be having a picnic a week from Saturday. Um, I hope you can all make it. Um, you can get there. You, Interstate 80 has got a lot of construction going on, I believe. But Highway 6 to West Liberty, before you get to West Liberty, uh, this is uh, a bend in the road. This is Oasis. This is a gravel road here. And uh, the uh, barn is right here. Easy to find these days with uh, different things. The, the picnic is July the 19th, <laughs> which is a Wednesday. And uh, that's right. So uh, it's on the Wednesday. And uh, you're supposed to bring your own stuff. Um, and it'll go from 5.30 to 8, and I'll be able to provide uh, tours probably at the beginning um, if you're interested. And again, you're welcome to bring friends and let other people know about the uh, picnic at the barn on Wednesday, July the 19th. <laughs> and, and when I asked him how many cars he has parking for, he said lots. Yeah, there's, there's lots of parking. There's been lots of events out there. Some of you have been out there, so it can easily fit 40 or 50 cars. So that should not be a problem. So um, anybody that has been out there, a few of you have been out there, would you like to add anything at all to the story or your experiences? Just wondering over the years where you got, what auctions or old threshers reunions or where you got all the antique m machinery and implements that are in there, plus the license plates, the tools. stuff I got at auctions. Uh, a lot of it was actually donated. There's a lot of uh, people that have, uh, a lot of people that have farms that are around here that, uh, you know, they have all this equipment and they're not sure what to do with it over time. It's just, you know, gathering and gathering. And so I've had lots of people contact me and actually uh, donate things. Uh, but I have been to auctions and yard sales and secondhand stores and picked up stuff. And uh, the problem is knowing when to stop <laughs> in some ways. But uh, the stuff's all on display. Uh, some of it needs to be in better p position. But I have volunteers that come out uh, on a regular basis, including last week, to clean up and uh, make sure things are visible and easy to recognize. And then I've had uh, I give tours. Uh, explaining what some of the stuff is, and I don't know what all the stuff is, but um, there's some explanations and some written things there as well. There's one table in the barn that has, um, it's covered in plastic, so because of the dust, but it, the sheet comes off, and then underneath that are binders with photographs and um, newspaper articles and uh, pictures of volunteers where things have come from, donated, stories people have made, and uh, that's all easily accessible right there on the first floor. But lots of donations from lots of people. I have a question. Um, what drew you to this barn in the first place? How did you find it, and, and how did that happen? Right, so uh, I was, as I said, I'm a city boy. And this, there was no plan at all about the barn. Um, I have always been interested in, I can say, um, architecture maybe, and maybe even a little bit of archeology. span But um, I just, uh, you know, a, a friend down the road had said that the farmer might sell this place. And I went down and saw it, and the 
barn was amazing, falling down. The house was dangerous to go in. <laughs> but um, as I said uh, originally, um, the price wasn't that much. He told me after a month he's found somebody else who wanted to buy it. And I said, OK, I'll take it. And so it was uh, pretty straightforward. He, no one lived on the property or had lived on it for quite a while. Are there other round barns in the country? Yes. And, so, and in Europe? And right, so the, there's, um, the round barns are primarily a Midwestern phenomena. And uh, one of the state historians, when I started off on this Lowell Soiki, has actually written a book on the round barns of Iowa. Um, so in the, uh, and in the um, brochure, which I'll get out um, and share afterwards for the barn tour that's going to happen um, later on in the year, there's several pictures. There's probably, I'm going to guess at one time there were 100 round barns in Iowa. And there's probably, you know, 25 or 30 left, maybe not that many. But uh, it was primarily a Midwestern phenomena. The arguments are that the round barns were primarily designed for uh, efficiency, for having all the animals face the inside and make it easier to feed them. Um, there were some arguments about uh, less expensive to build or something, but I'm not sure that's true. At least for me, the, the strongest argument in Iowa is the round barns deflected the wind. So I think that's a very important advantage of having these round barns deflecting the strong winds. So are these round barns the only ones that have these laminated beams, or are there other? I mean, was that like a companies that offered laminated beams, or, or you said yeah. an individual built them? Well, there, there weren't a lot of companies, but there were barn builders at the time, but it was not that common. The, the lamination um, was still pretty rare. Um, the, the lamination was needed here to make the arch sure. and, the, and the, the, the roof going up on top of that. So uh, even though a lot of the, the other barns are, are round, they didn't always, they didn't, most of them did not use the lamination. That was pretty rare. Later on, um, these things were done with glue. Uh, but and in fact, has anybody been to the Celebration Barn? Yeah. That was copied off of my barn. Yeah. It was, it's like, I think, three of my barns squished together. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, this, the lamination was pretty special, but needed for the arches. And as far as you can tell, was this person a Kaplan person? I mean, this seems to be like quite an innovator to have all these different things uh, all in one right. arm set. So the, the Frank Longer beam, the, uh, the carpenter, um, and I, now his family actually donated, they sent, I think from California, his actually a tool chest. So I have his tool chest where he had his tools. But um, he worked for many years and came to, I have the, in one of those talks I give where he came from out, out east. And um, he was very successful and built some barns around West Branch and, and had a very nice house that I showed you that eventually disappeared, but he was successful. Um, Joshua Seacrest, the farmer, um, when he retired, uh, his son took over the barn, and he um, moved, and I've been out and taken pictures to Summit Street, which was the street in Iowa City um, with the fanciest homes and things on it. And so Joshua Seacrest was, and his wife moved out there and lived on Summit Street. Um, the second half of that story is that the, the barn was actually lost by the Seacrest family in the Great Depression, which followed you know, 20 or 30, 40 years later. And the, f the farm was lost completely. A question up here? What's the point of a cupola? Does a cupola have any 
function or is it just decorative? <laughs> it's so hard to get to. Yes. Well, um, it is possible to get to it. It's a little challenging and scary, but my understanding is um, that the heat would would have to rise and go out the windows. So in the and maybe the smell or the fumes, whatever was in there. So I'm guessing that primarily it was for ventilation. Now, having said that, and I don't usually talk about this, there are several uh, initials carved out there from the good old days, including one of the Seacrest daughters. So I'm, I'm sure it's a great place to take your boyfriend or girlfriend <laughs> up in the cupola and look over the countryside. Is it allowed? Um, there's lots of light in the cupola, but there's not a lot of, there, there are uh, windows um, uh, on all sides, and I had to replace those. The, that was interesting. So there's not a lot of light, but I have light. I had to put up, I put in electricity and plumbing. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of light now, uh, including fancy things hanging down from the, from the top. Um, but the... Uh, the electricity had to go in there, and lights had to be functional, um, and things like that. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rich. This has been fascinating. And for those of you at home, I don't even know if I'm on a camera right now. But please do join us July 19th, which is a week from today, Wednesday, out at the Seacrest Barn. Um, if you go to the library's website, next Wednesday in the calendar is a description of the event and the address of the barn, which I don't know off the top of my head. What is the address? 5750 Osage Street. 5750 Osage Street, Downey, right? Well, it's, it's just outside of Downey. <laughs> the, the postal address is West Liberty, which makes no sense at all. No. But it's because that's where the post office, the closest the post office is that the mail goes through. But if you just type in 5750 Osage Street, uh, you'll, you'll find it. Okay. And I hope to see all of you at the picnic. Thank you, Rich. This was wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.